happy to have you with us again today as we continue our study of Jesus as a theologian. And in our, dis in our discussion of Jesus as a theologian, we have talked about the infield or the running of the infield, which are the major points of the dynamic movement of his theology. And we said that these begin with God, that God reaches out to us in Christ in a costly demonstration of love, that there are sinners of two kinds, those who keep the law and those who don't, don't both in need of that same love. To accept it is in itself the act of repentance, which grants a new status in the presence of Christ and that the believer then responds in thankfulness for what he has received. Now, it is this response of thankfulness and what it requires that is our topic today. And for this, we will be looking at a number of texts of two kinds. One is in the question of the cost of discipleship, and the other is the question of prayer, because both of them are forms of response in gratitude for what we have received. Both of them are forms of the acting out of loyalty to a new relationship. If you have a new friend, you are going to offer thanks to that friend for what he does for you, and you're going to talk to that friend and indicate your need of him as a person. How much more so God who reaches out to us in Christ. And so our first text is in Luke 9, and I hope you have the passage before you in the outline form that is available with this cassette. And so would you look at that with me, please, for just a minute, and we'll see the flow of the ideas in the text. And here we are. The scene breaks into three little cameos, if you please. The first one is the fellow who is a volunteer. He says, I will follow you and he is answered with a parable. And the flow of the ideas are the question of follow, then the idea of go, and then the question of the price. Scene two is not a volunteer, but is a recruit. Jesus says, follow me. Then we have the same ideas, go, and the question of price. The question of price is repeated. The idea of go is repeated and then the fact of follow me, now defined in terms of proclamation of the gospel. In the third scene, we go back to the idea of a volunteer, and also the idea of go is there in some of the ancient copies of the, of the New Testament, particularly the old Syriac, although some of our Greek texts do not have that word. Never mind, the idea is there if the word is not there. And then the question of price, and the question of price is again discussed in a parable. So we have a flow of ideas in three scenes, and we have two parables, a parable at the end and a parable at the beginning. And we must look briefly at each of these scenes and see the culture that is behind them, out of which we can discover what our Lord is saying. So in the first scene, <clears throat> this young man is eager to go. We don't we can't say young, we don't know his age. He's eager to follow. And so he says, I'm ready to go anywhere. Very bold language. Now, if Jesus had been a Westerner, he would have presented his ideas as follows. He would have said, have you really thought this over? And are you ready to pay the price? By way of illustration, I don't even have a bed to sleep on. But no, Jesus delivers a parable. The parable, as T.W. Manson, the great scholar of England, has said, is probably symbolic language. The foxes, as we know from the gospel themselves, the word fox was a word often used for the Herodians. The Herodians were a very clever crowd, and regardless of how the various wars of the Middle East came out, Herod and his family always managed like a cat to land on their feet or like a clever fox to sniff out what was happening and keep themselves safe. They were a very large family, a very powerful family. So Jesus may be saying, look, the foxes, these Herodians, have their holes. If you want the power and security of this ruling class in our society, why don't you go talk to them? And in, much of, in some 
of the apocalyptic literature of the Jews between the Old and the New Testament, we find the birds of the air as a symbol for the Romans, the ruling class, the imperial Rome. You couldn't say nasty things about the Romans in print, and so they would use this symbol, the birds of the air, to refer to the Romans, as T.W. Manson has pointed out. And so Jesus saying the birds of the air have their roosts may be a reference to them. You want the security and power of the Herodians, the Jewish ruling class? Fine, you go to them. You want the power and security of, of the Romans? You go to them. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. The symbol of the Son of Man comes out of the book of Daniel in the seventh chapter, and when you read it there, it is a symbol of someone who comes from God and from the clouds of heaven with great power and authority, and all the nations are under that authority. All the saints bow down. And so one is amazed, and certainly this person must have been shocked to the deepest levels of his being, to have the idea of son, and son of man and the idea of rejection put together. And indeed, our Lord is the one who has discovered that he is the Son of Man, the one who comes in power, and he is the suffering servant out of the servant songs of Isaiah. And these two have come together in his ministry, and how hard it was for those who follow him to appreciate that. It is easy to follow a master who is successful, but how about a master who suffers and who is rejected? For the one who follows in that path must also endure the same suffering and rejection. What does the fellow do? We don't know. We are not told. Then comes the second scene, and this fellow says, well, look, I want to go and bury my father. And so, as Ibrahim Said, one of the Arab commentators of the Middle East, has pointed out, as all Middle Eastern Christians have always seen from the very first time in which this text was heard, this fellow is not asking, can I attend the funeral? This would be ridiculous. If his father had died, he wouldn't be sitting beside the road listening to who this fellow Jesus is. He would be beside the coffin of his father back in the ancestral home. That's not the point. When he says, I want to go and first bury my father, this is a traditional phrase. I've heard lots of Middle Easterners say it. Somebody wants to immigrate to Brazil, and then somebody else in the family says, aren't you going to bury your father first? By which they mean, aren't you going to wait for another 20 years until your father dies and you with respect lay him in his grave, and after that, then you are free to go and do what you like. But surely you're not going to leave the community until your parents are taken to their heavenly reward. This is not appropriate. This is not the custom. You can't do this. Now, this fellow is saying, yes, I will be glad to follow you, Jesus, but there is a requirement over me, and that is to fulfill the expectations of my peer group. The people around me expect certain, certain things of me, and after I have fulfilled what the society around me wants, then I will look and see what I can do in discipleship to you. Jesus' answer is very sharp. And he says, let the dead bury the dead. There are plenty of spiritually dead out there who will be able to take care of the requirements of the culture of which you are a part. The standard of your discipleship is not, I do what society expects, and then I find out if I have time left. No, my requirements are above that of the peer group within which you live, which has its very harsh requirements, which press upon you. And so then we come to the third scene. And the third scene is another volunteer. He says, I will follow, follow you, but let me go. And unfortunately, we have translated this and say goodbye to those who are at home. In every language, when people are parting from other people, there are two things that happen. One is you can say goodbye, and the other is you can take leave of. Now, this particular Greek verb occurs six times in the New Testament, and all other five times we have traditionally translated it, take leave of, and for reasons that I can't figure out, this sixth time we have translated it, say goodbye to. 
You see, when you're at a party and you want to leave early, what do you do? You go to the hostess and you take leave of the hostess, which means you say to the hostess, Jane, I'm really very sorry. I hope you don't mind. I have to slip out. You're asking permission. And this language formalized in every culture is very specifically formalized in the Middle East. You take leave of the person when you walk out. In Lebanese colloquial, we say, بخطركم, with your permission. And then the other person responds and says, go with God or may God be with you or something of that kind. You even say this when you walk out of a shop having bought a pencil. And certainly you say this when you leave home. You don't leave until the person gives you permission. You say, with your permission, and then that person says, may God go with you, then you walk out. Okay, that's what this fellow is saying. He's saying, why, of course, Jesus, I'll be glad to follow you. But uh, you don't really mean that your authority is higher than the authority of my family. I mean, after all, the extended family is the final authority in all things. And so you've got some fine ideas, but I've got to check at home first and ask their permission. I have to take leave of them. And if dad and mom and the uncles and the aunts say, that's fine, I'll be here. But if they don't, why, of course, you can't expect me to come. And Jesus' answer is, I am requiring of you a very specific and difficult task. The plows of the Middle East in that time and the hand and the a handheld and animal-driven plows, which are still used to this day, are not that easy to control. The pioneer in the American West got a hold of his plow with two hands. Ours, you hold on to them with one hand, and the other hand, and hand, you have a long goad with which you keep the animal going, an ox usually. And you have to be able to lift this thing up over big stones, or the end of it's going to be broken off. And you have to be very careful not to score into the ground that you're going to plow next time you come back or you'll ruin the next furrow, nor can you slip into the furrow you have just cut or the water isn't going to run off properly. And so you've got to concentrate very specifically on what you're doing. Be sure you don't hit a stone. Keep the animal going. Don't turn this way or that. Keep your eye at the end of the furrow so that the thing is going to be straight. And this takes total concentration. And if you're always looking back, hey, Dad, how am I doing? You're not going to make it. And so we have a very clear and a very strong agricultural image that says the requirements of the kingdom require that you put your mind to the task and do not put your mind as to whether your family approves or disapproves. I grant you when the family disapproves of the discipleship of a Christian, this is excruciatingly painful. But in Christ, there is no authority higher than the authority of our Lord himself. Well, so this is then a part of, as we have seen other texts, call for discipleship. Let's look now and see something about what our Lord tells us in our thankful response for love received, how we are to pray. And he also gives us some parables about this subject. One of them has been called the parable of the friend at midnight. And this parable has a couple of places in it in which we have allowed ourselves to be very badly confused. You see, we've translated this text and understood it as though a fellow has a friend in the middle of the night, and so he doesn't have a decent meal, and then he goes to the neighbor. We think he knocks on the neighbor's door. He doesn't. And the neighbor says, I'm busy, and the kids are asleep, and I can't do anything. And then we thought that he kept banging and shouting at that door until finally the neighbor, in desperation, gave him what he wants. Now, that's the way we've traditionally read it. I submit to you that this is in error for two reasons. One reason is there is no hint in the story itself that he keeps on sh shouting and banging on the door. That's simply not there. Our ideas come from a single word which we will now examine with some care. But the other reason is, you see, in this parable, the person who goes to his friend in the night receives an answer. And the answer is, I'm busy, 
the kids are asleep, the door is locked, I don't want to get up. So the answer is no. Now, think it over, friend. In the prayer life of our Lord and everything the New Testament teaches us about prayer, are we supposed to come to God and ask him for what we want? And if we hear him say no, loud and clear, are we supposed to start badgering him and irritating him, hoping that he will finally, in semi-anger, say, well, look, I'm sick and tired of you, so, so I'm going to change my mind to get rid of you, and then he changes his mind. Or are we supposed to say, thy will be done? Now, the idea of persistence in prayer is in the text of the New Testament. It's clear in the prayer life of our Lord. It's very clear in the parable of the unjust judge in which the woman is persistent in her prayer, but she is persistent because she does not have an answer. Persistence in prayer is perfectly appropriate in the spiritual life of the believer up until the time we have an answer. And when we have the answer, if it is yes, we are to accept it. And if it is no, like our Lord himself in the Garden of Gethsemane, we are to say, thy will be done. All right, now what are we going to do with this story? First of all, let's look at its form, and then we'll try and look at its content. The form of the story, we have the introduction. He said to them, can any one of you imagine having a friend and going to him at midnight? So the, Jesus is asking a question for which he expects an emphatic negative answer. Can you imagine this thing happening? Can you imagine somebody saying, friend, lend me three loaves. A friend of mine has come on a journey. I have nothing to set before him. And then the ideas repeat. This is not the answer he's going to give, we are told. No, rather, here's what's going to happen. He's not going to give up and give him anything, having arisen because of being his friend, but because of his avoidance of shame he will get up and give him whatever he wants. This is what is not going to happen, and this is what is going to happen. All right, let's talk about this now for a minute. Jesus has this little phrase, tis ex humon, in Greek, which every time he uses it, he is saying, can you imagine that if I jump off a tree, I can flap my arms and, and fly like a bird? When I say that, I'm expecting a very strong negative answer. I'm expecting you to say, of course not, impossible. All right, so that's what Jesus is expecting. And what is he saying? He's saying, can you imagine a guest comes to you in the night and you go to a neighbor and asking for, ask for something as simple as a loaf of bread and that dum-dum says to you, well, I can't because the kids are asleep and I'm already in bed and the door is locked. Can you imagine that happening to you? And the audience says, no way. This would be like in America my saying to you, can you imagine your house catching on fire in the middle of the night and you go to the neighbor in desperation and you say, hey, bud, let me use the phone to call the fire department. And he says, the kids are asleep and I don't want to disturb them. Can you imagine that happening? And of course, you're going to say, no way, of course not. In the Middle East, the children are obedient. So they're asleep. So what? So the door's locked. Never mind. It's an emergency. The guy's got a guest. He can't provide what is adequate. Now, mind you, the conversation that is taking place between this fellow and the neighbor is overheard by everybody on the alley. They're all listening. And so what is the point of the story? The point of the story is this guy doesn't like you. And it is the middle of the night, and he is asleep, and the door is locked, and he doesn't want to get up, but he's going to, because the neighbors are listening, and if he doesn't, they're all going to say, oh, come on, that guy really gave you a hard time. Are you the fellow who's looking for the loaf of bread? Are you going to go back to your guest and say, sorry, I can't feed you? No, you'll go to the rest of the people in the alley, and they'll give you what you want, and they're going to say, oh, that no good so-and-so. Man, that was really terrible that he said he wasn't going to open the door. So this fellow asleep, even though he doesn't like you, 
He's going to give you, as the story says, whatever you want. Why? Because he is a man of honor, and he is going to preserve his honor. The Greek word in the text literally means to be without shame. As a Greek word, the Greeks did use it to mean shamelessness. But when you really look at it, the two parts of that word, it means to be without shame, which is a good quality. It's not shameless, which is a bad quality. And that's the way we should read it, very, very literally. And so Jesus is saying, this fellow certainly isn't going to give those dumb excuses. What he is going to do in order that he, the man asleep inside, might be without shame. Nobody blames him. He's going to get up and not only give you the loaf of bread, he's going to give you whatever you want. And so Jesus is saying, okay, you believers, you've got problems. It's in the night. You come to God with your needs, and your God is not a neighbor who doesn't like you and who is asleep, and the door is locked, and the kids are asleep, and he really doesn't want to be bothered. No, a God of love will give you all that you need. Look at this fellow. He got all that he needed, even though everything was against his request being answered. So why are you ashamed or afraid? This man, to preserve his own honor, will give you what you want. How much more a God of love will fulfill your needs? Do not be afraid. Go to him with your request. Now, the reason we've decided in the long history of interpretation that this fellow who doesn't even do any banging on the door at all, we've decided that somehow he was knocking and that he kept on knocking, is that the very next section right there in the text is also about prayer, but it's a poem. And it's a poem about prayer in which there is persistence in prayer. I hope you have the page in front of you and so thereby you will be able to follow along with us as we look very briefly at the structure of the text. And here it is. The text falls into three stanzas, and the first one has six lines, which I call step parallelism. We've got the asking is the first line and the fifth line. The seeking is the, sorry, and the fourth line. The seeking is the second line and the fifth line and the knocking is the third line and the sixth line. And these are verbs in what we call a continuous present. That means that these are things which you keep on doing. And you see the idea of knocking is here in the text, but it's not there in the story of the friend at midnight. He doesn't knock at all. He calls. And what is being said here is that there is a future you shall be given, And there is a present, the one who asks, receives. There is also an active, seek and you shall find. There is a passive, knock and it shall be open to you. Our prayer life involves an active and a passive. Sometimes we ourselves seek and we find, and sometimes we knock and we wait patiently until it is opened. Some things are given to us in the future and we wait for them and some things we receive in the present. The overall message of this six lines is, don't worry, you will receive. Skip now to six lines at the end of this marvelously constructed poem and you can see that line four is talking about the giver, you being evil, line five about the gifts, you know good gifts, Line six about those who receive them to give to your children. The giver is God the Father. The gift is out of heaven, Holy Spirit, and those who ask him will receive it. And so we're talking now about the gift will be good. Look now, if you will, to the middle. And in the middle, we have three illustrations, two of them in Matthew and two of them in Luke. I suggest to you that our Lord gave them all three of them together. And they're all three about a son who asks for bread is going to be fed bread and not a stone that looks like a piece of bread. 
And when he asks for a fish, his father is not going to give him an eel, which was considered unclean. Sometimes the fishermen caught them, and they always threw them back. And when he asks for an egg, there was up to the 19th century a very white scorpion, which if you caught under a stone, all curled up, looked like a little bird's egg. And the father isn't going to give to his son that, that scorpion. Rather, he will be fed an egg. And in any one of these three stories, you know the father is going to feed his son, and what he gives him is going to be good. And so in this marvelously constructed story, a poem with its three parables in the middle, the theme of don't worry, God will answer your prayers, and don't worry, what he gives you will be good, is there in the outlying phrases, and it's there in the three marvelous parables right there in the middle of the story. Parallel to this text, we have also the story of the friend at midnight in the 18th chapter of Luke. And let us, in closing, look just very briefly at a couple of high points at that story. And so we will first look at the text and then talk, talk about what it means. As in some of the other parables of Jesus, we have also seen a kind of a tick talk form. Here we're talking about the judge in the first three lines, and then we talk about the widow in the next three lines, and then we talk about the judge again in the first three lines, and then by contrast we go back to the widow in the next three lines. A form that seems to be a form that our Lord likes to use because quite a number of his shorter parables fall into it. Let's talk about what he's saying in that particular parable. Here the theme is, indeed, the question of persistence. The widow in the Old Testament was the classic symbol of somebody who is completely helpless. She has no man to defend her in a men's world before the outside world, and she has God alone to rely upon. So this poor gal doesn't even have any cousins or any older son or any nephews who can go to court for her, and in the Middle East in the first century, the Jewish women did not go to court, as we can tell from the, from the Talmud, but the men did. The women would sit at home. Because she's in the court, we know that she is really alone. Now, what's the judge like? The phrase that we have in Greek is the phrase which represents a very important Middle Eastern idea of somebody whom you cannot shame. The literal word here in Greek means somebody. You cannot shame him. You, th there's nothing to appeal to. You can't say, for God's sake. He doesn't care about God. You can say, for man's sake. It doesn't matter. And this is a, we have this in a colloquial and in classical speech. The kind of a person, you can't shame him because there is no ethical standard in the man's life to appeal to. You can't say, haram shame on you, because he doesn't feel any shame. And so this is a man who feels no shame before God or before man. And not only that, he knows it. These kind of people usually don't admit it. But this is a, such a rascally character, he even knows you can't shame him. So what does this gal do? She comes and finally wears him down with her continual asking, and he says, this gal's going to give me a black eye, which is the literal of the text. It doesn't mean she's going to attack him, because he doesn't say she'll give me a back eye, black eye with her big stick. He says she will give me a black eye with her continual coming. And of course, he's joking. If she tried to get violent, they would throw her out. But in the Middle East, women can say things to men that men can't say. She can walk in and really give it to him in a way that the men couldn't because they would beat up on the man. So the one tool she's got is the ability to put her case in very sharp language and to keep after this character. And so here is the most hopeless kind of a person you can imagine before the most hopeless kind of a judge that we can imagine who cannot be shamed, who has no ethics, no morals, no standard of shame, and yet... Her request is answered. And so Jesus is using the rabbinic principle of from the light to the heavy, how much more 
the believer before God, if we are persistent in our prayers, will find them answered. We need not be ashamed or afraid to trust in the God of love who will answer our deepest need.